Her activities brought her to the notice of the Zentrim, and after she'd slain six Zent Magelings sent to kill her, one after another, Manchun himself far scried her and found himself fascinated. <laughs> Hey folks, welcome back to another Realms Lore video. I am here with Ed Greenwood, original creator of the Forgotten Realms. And uh, Ed, you want to tell the folks a little bit about what, what we're going to be uh, seeing in the video today? We're going to talk about one of Manchun's lovers, Singarl Mahrul, known as the Shadow Sill, last seen in the pages of my novel Spellfire back in 1987. So, if you are enjoying these videos, please be sure to like, subscribe, turn on notifications so you can be let known when the next video comes out. And also, please consider checking out Ed on Patreon. If you go to patreon.com slash edgreenwood, you can get lots more realms lore like this, uh, tons of works in progress, and other really great benefits. Uh, and the support from that is actually what facilitates us being able to continue making videos like this. So, please enjoy this realms lore video on the Shadow Sill. More than Manchun's lover. Or, what's a shadow sill? Simgarl Marul was last seen alive in my novel Spellfire, where she met her demise while riding a blue dragon, Draculich Agastom, into battle against Chandral Chasser and the Knights of Mithranor. She tried to annihilate them, but had her own meteor swarm turned back on her by Elminster. In the conflagration, Agastom was destroyed. A dying Simgarl refused Elminster's offer of succor, saying she was too set in her ways to change her life, as he was hoping she would. She died thanks to her shame. Elminster, her sometime mentor, had been the only person she loved, admired, and trusted in life. In large part because of his kindness to her, in smaller part because of the magic he had so freely given her, and also because of his gentle refusal to succumb to her advances. She died because she chose to refuse his aid, knowing she would later inevitably betray him a second time. We see so little of Simgarl in the novel that it's easy to dismiss her as one more beautiful bitch of a villain, the lover of Manchun and a figure of screaming evil. Yet, even some gamers and readers who've done that have asked the same question others pose. She's called the Shadow Sill, but what's a Shadow Sill? Patience, seekers after knowledge, put fewer courses before carts. Let us trail fingertips across harp strings and peel back the years to do this more or less chronologically. Born in 1273 DR to skilled crafters, casters and metalsmiths in the long vanished minor barony of Maharatal in Chasenta, northeast of Pandrick in what is now South River Sebakar, that is the part of the vast Adder Swamp that lies south of the River Adder, but was then rolling woodlots and pasture lands where many fine horses were bred and fiery Tarn Sarah, a sort of amber almond brandy was made, Simgala Marul was what we might call a tomboy when young. Free-spirited and even rebellious, she roamed the barony at will, playing pranks and stealing apples and wild riding many horses bareback by leaping uninvited onto their backs and goading them into gallops for her own entertainment. She relocated to Zental Keep when in her early teens, where her parents established a flourishing casting business, making hinges, hasps, door knockers, mounting brackets, edge caps for doors and windows, and the like. From birth, Simgaro Marul was always beautiful, lithe, graceful, and strongly gifted with long, flowing, glossy black hair. She developed a strong sense of confidence and pride by her teens, and having a sensual nature, no modesty whatsoever, and enjoying sex, took to using her beauty to get what she wanted. She was consecrated to her mother's patron deity, Lathander, from whose altar her true name was heard, Lanshera. Playmates, adventuring companions, and tutors in her younger years sometimes called her Sima or Simbra, but she didn't care what she was called so long as no one tried to tell her what to do, unless it was details of wielding magic. By the time Simgarl attained her 20th year, her parents were rich and devoting themselves to perfecting ever larger and clearer glass windows 
for the grander new buildings of Zental Keep and the increasingly wealthy cities of the Moon Sea and Dragon Reach. They happily paid for tutelage in the art because it seemed the only thing that made their wayward, ever restless daughter happy. Avoiding the important, recruitment minded, and expensive Zentrim, Aldrin and Nemeraretha Marul hired lowly adventuring mage after lowly adventuring mage to instruct their daughter, which did wonders for both Simgarl's confidence and her street smarts as these tutors had all been traveling adventurers forced to make do and improvise, really working the scant magic they had. Simgarl seduced them all, absorbed all the magic they knew, learned their most precious secrets, and moved on to the next one. First the sardonic and handsome Rindle Hale Moon of Westgate, then the fussy and controlling Endrar Voldrant of Kalant, then the urbane, hooded-eyed schemer Umir Kashlak of Memnon, and finally, Renchesra Redtress's Honderlisk of Lyrabar, bidding her parents a fond farewell and saying falsely that she'd return to visit often, Simgarl Marul became an adventuring mage in the Moon Sea North, having many escapades with an ever-changing cast of companions that most local rulers would have termed brigandry, as she and her fellow adventurers often raided caravans and mining camps and arranged ambushes and breakneck traps for local law swords sent out on patrol by such rulers. Eventually, Simgarl came to the notice of the Cult of the Dragon, who recruited her. She was always loyal to herself first and the cult second, using her service as a way of gaining magic magical contacts, and a bodyguard as she explored the wider realms on cult missions. For some years, Simgarl saw the Heartlands on behalf of the cult, from Chacenta and Impilter west to Tethyr and the Sword Coast north of it. She established several hideholds in remote ruins where she cached magic, healing potions in particular, they in spellbooks were the treasure she most prizes and where she would go to hide and work on her art when her actions made things too hot for her. In the cult, she established a reputation for being competent, very dangerous, and ruthless. Many fellow cult members wanted nothing to do with her for fear they'd pay with their lives to be her scapegoats, fodder, or just momentary obstacles. During this time, Simgarl Marul found certain long-lost writings that enabled her, coupled with the strength of her gift in the art and her perseverance, to successfully recreate the formula for potions of longevity. She drank three such quaffs, all of her own making. It's long been rumored among the Zentrum that she established a cache of four or more additional longevity potions that hasn't yet been found in her lifetime. As a result, she seemed young and lush throughout her life, though she was 84 years old at the time of her death. Her activities brought her to the notice of the Zentrim, and after she'd slain six Zent Magelings sent to kill her, one after another, Manshun himself far scried her and found himself fascinated. So his meeting with her was a recruitment attempt and not an attack, and she became his apprentice, and soon, an effective senior member of the Zentrum, her influence through her association with Manchun far greater than her formal rank and seniority would otherwise have granted her. Though she entered into this association in order to gain more magic and power, and not out of any loyalty to Manchun or the Zentrum, uh, Manchun, by the way, was not fooled as to this, she soon became as trusted a Zent operative as any entity was ever trusted by Manchun, Fazul, or the Beholders backing them. Simgarl managed to convince powerful senior members of the Cult of the Dragon that she was infiltrating the Zentrum on behalf of the Cult, and as she always managed her personal relationships with cult-friendly dragons and draco liches, was able to bring several of the latter into alliances or service with the Zentrum gaining Zent respect as a result. She pulled the same trick again with Manchun and the Zentrum when she began tutelage under Elminster Almar. 
convincing them that she would be a spy on him and his fellow chosen and meddling harpers for the Black Network. The Zents all knew she was drawn to magical power as a moth to a flame and would find any pretext for such associations, but they saw the very real benefits to her consorting with the old mage of Shadowdale and contented themselves with keeping very close eyes on her to guard against the treachery they were sure was coming. Simgarl sought out Elminster to teach her early in Flame Rule of 1294 DR after praying at a Wilderland Shrine altar to Mistra one starry night on a hilltop west of Elventry, a spot known as Lissa's Rest after Taranthralissa, the lady mage buried there, and receiving guidance from the goddess of magic. Mistra had seen that Simgarl Marul was enough of a user as to likely betray any tutor or benefactor, such as Elminster, but also thought her ambition would make her an energetic creator of spells, and her associations with organizations in order to gain more magic would cause her to spread magic throughout her life, as she did as a member of both the Cult of the Dragon and the Centurim, so she wanted Simgarul, guided for a time by Elminster, to temper her innate selfishness and rudeness and make her a better instrument of Mistra, that is, a better spreader and sharer of magic. Enough already, Ed, get to the Shadow Cell. Right, stage more than set. So here's your Bahart to Jizuli Drag. Ah, uh, ah, uh, um, Shadow Cell. Already. Mm -hmm. Before praying to Mistra and then seeking out Elminster to be her tutor, Simgarl Marul had bestowed the title of the Shadow Sill on herself and firmly used it, and only it, when attending mage fairs. She hadn't bothered to grace a mage fair with her presence until she was the Shadow Sill, but her cult and Zent activities had made her well known, by reputation at least, among wizards across the Heartlands. So why the Shadow Sill, and what's a Shadow Sill anyway? Well, Simgarl gave herself the title of the Shadow Sill after swallowing the fragments of the shattered shadow crown that she found when exploring and plundering a tomb that was dug into the side of the river Thent Gorge, halfway between Lake Thentar and Thentia. She did this to gain the crown's magical powers. It allowed her to see in normal magical darkness and showed her, in her mind, how to work any shadow magic, that's Telfurian magic, not shadow weave magic from Shar, spell she wanted to use, such as Shadow Step and Shadow Walk, without the need for material components. There have been several quite different shadow crowns in the realms down the ages, but this particular one was made by a long dead sorceress of Thentia who called herself the Shadow Sill when she ruled Thendia from 796 DR to 799 DR, the city of Thentia was founded upon her death as freedom from her whims allowed local miners and entrepreneurs to dare to build and invest at last. Her real name was Murla Havalk. She was a wild talent wielder of the art from Teshborol and Kalamshan, and the tomb Simgara looted was hers. Enough of her sentience remained within the crown to turn Simgarl to evil, or as before subsuming the crown, Simgarl Marul was guilty only of ruthless ambition. The Shadow Sill's crown made her cruel and an unhesitating killer. And there you have it, the tale of Simgarl Marul, the Shadow Sill. You can see her face smiling slyly at you to this day in one of the king's tears adorning her earrings that Elminster kept as a remembrance of her after her death. I'm not quite sure what you could do, though, to induce him to show them to you. He remembers her with fond sadness. One more lost love in far too high account of them. Welcome back to Realm Speak, and this time around we're tackling this. This is the capital of Mistledale in the Dale Lands, a shaman fort. So four syllables, emphasis on the second. There's a pattern here, a shaman floor. And of course, people don't say it that slowly. They go, a shaman floor, a shaman floor. It's the river Ashaba, and it was forded here. There's now a bridge, but for years there was just the ford, and it was the easiest place to ford the Ashaba. So 
It was the Ashabanth.